the goal with every record that we make, did we make something that satiated the need to create within us? And did we make something that would be useful for the people that will hear it? I don't want to die At least not without you Alone here in the August heat The shadows of the afternoon I don't try to run I mean, we've never thought this would last this long. That's what's so like kind of hard to process about the whole thing. Like our first Warped Tour, we were sitting there talking about how we'd break up. Like I remember early on talking about how we'd never be someone's favorite band. The first time I remember playing a show with Wonder Years where people liked us was in Montrose, Pennsylvania. And we played like a cafe for like 25 people that never heard us. Uh, and like 20 of them like jumped up and down and like seemed to have just such a great time. They were so carried away with the music. And that was like my first time really experiencing that. It's highly uh, uh, unusual, you know, when you actually crunch the numbers, uh, uh, you know, for a band like, um, like ours to be doing this for so long. From a logistical standpoint, just to get there, from a band, for a band to be able to make seven records and for people to want to hear seven records is already kind of an anomaly. On the creative side, it's like, I don't know where it comes from, right? Like, the Wonder Years records, like, keep getting better, record over record, right? That, to me, is a totally new, also an anomaly. For me, what I know as an artist who makes things and as someone who consumes art by people who have made a lot of things, the challenge is not, you know, not always are people going to like this. It's really how good can I still be with what I know about the world and what I know about myself through the world. I think we learn something from every time we make a record or a write a song even you know what i mean or you write a group of songs and i don't think the same pressures exist every time is because like is this good enough that it warrants being created you know what i mean like should are you making something are you making like art or music that you can be proud of and that will connect with other people and if you're not then why are you doing it it's always a thought in your head that you know what if this record doesn't do well you know, what if it doesn't allow us to keep doing the thing that we love doing? The second you have to step out on stage and play songs that you don't necessarily wholeheartedly believe in or, you know, feel like the purpose is not uh, is not 100% solidified in the conviction of that, you're going to get a very different result and you're going to get a very different show. And I think the people that you're playing for are going to call bullshit. I feel like there's always pressure with the record. There's always expectations, you know? I have a running joke with every band. I think pretty, I'm pretty sure I said this with Wonder Years 2 at some point. I'm like, man, if if this was a new, if we got to like rename the band right now and just have this be like a new thing, this would be the biggest shit in the world, you know? Cause there's no expectations. They can just enjoy it for what it is. And you don't have to expect, oh man, this doesn't sound like the Wonder Years or this doesn't sound like this band or this band. Guys. Is someone in Gordon here? I was telling them we used to do punk rock shows here, and uh, 
and now they're they're interviewing me for a piece and I was like they wanted to see where we used to play our first like couple of shows so here we are awesome. yeah so they, like this is the space and it's funny they when we started doing shows here they were like hey we built you a stage but it was like too small for a whole band yeah. to fit on <laughs> and so they we would just put the drum kit on it and everyone would play in front of it yeah. um, and then some shows we would just do them on that wall instead it's crazy how small this room seems now. Yeah. The thing about Wonder Years at this point was like we were not a real band. Yeah. And so <laughs> we only had like three songs. Mm -hmm. And so what we like we would ask our friends if we could play in between sets. So like a band would play and they would just give us their gear and, and we'd plug in the keyboard and we would just play our three songs and then like we wouldn't be on like the flyer. Um, and that was like our first couple shows. I feel like all bands reach a place in their career after a certain number of records where they become self-aware of what their audience expects and what the kind of package of their art is and represents and sounds like. There are these two pitfalls that bands fall into. And the first is that because they're self-aware, they start imitating themselves. It becomes this kind of gimmick of self-pastiche. And they lose the sort of heart and authenticity that they started with. Or, to avoid doing that, bands will experiment just for the sake of experimentation. And again, we'll lose, we'll lose the heart, we'll lose the core of why they started doing it. Said the test of time because these songs are really classic. They're not very topical. They're, you know, they're things that people can relate to it. Whatever age you are, you could be 21 and just, you know, trying to figure out like what you're going to do after you graduate or if you should go to college or not. And then um, you could be, you know, 30 and like wanting to settle down and have a family. I came in to Hopeless, not a big fan of pop punk music. And when they were like, hey, we're putting out a new Wonder Years record, I was like, okay, cool, like, let me listen to them more. And the more time I spent with it, the more I saw that there was much more going on than like a traditional pop punk band. And then once I talked to Dan and he told me everything that he was doing with his music, both on the lyrics and the storytelling, I really, really got invested in it. <laughs> have the same connection um, with the people in the audience. And I don't know, I guess just getting to follow along that journey and, and know that they never shirked that honesty and what they value makes for a kind of fan base I've never seen. It is, it's just kind of surreal. And if I'm completely honest, I really don't think about it that much because it freaks me out. Because like, it's amazing that they like us this much. And if they stop, we're fucked. <laughs> I think what makes the Wonder Years fascinating is that they have kind of opted out of the machinery of nostalgia. They've instead really tried to work hard to articulate through song, through album, full album vision, through all of this, what it means to grow up and have to leave some things behind and stumble upon some new things in the process. They kind of have found a path towards growing up that isn't entirely off-putting. You know, we went into this this meeting and I think Dan uh, Supi was saying to me, um, I'm kind of lost on what to do. I don't know where to go with this. And I think coming off of the last record, like they were progressing into this really creative, like more indie rock space. But you know, obviously, so many of the fans want that raw energy that that, that comes from Wonder Years. And I said to Dan, "Look, I, you are a genre called the Wonder Years at this stage. You're a genre called the Wonder Years. You're not pop punk. You're not indie rock. You're none of those things. The genre is Wonder Years. I want you to go make a Wonder Years record that speaks of where your life is at with the sound aggression." And, and, and sort of forward motion that has always been your band. I don't want you to become a genre because it feels like you should be. You are the Wonder Years. Be the Wonder Years. Be that for your fans, your fans who are your friends, who you are their mentors. You know, like, let's stop trying to be a thing. Let's be the thing we've already created that is incredible. And uh, uh, to my shock, that worked. When you make a record, you have to ask yourself why I'm making a record. And 
if the answer to that question is because I am contractually obligated to make a record, then don't make a fucking record. <laughs> I know when we were making No Closer to Heaven, he had a severe writer's block for, for at least a little point during when we were in pre-production. I thought he had such a such an idea because, you know, like No Closer to Heaven was like the outlier um, with all the records we'd done because the other ones all had like a theme and No Closer to Heaven didn't have, it had a, more of a loose theme. It didn't have like a specific thing. And this record had, again, had a theme. We do this. I am a person who is sad. <laughs> I, that is just a fact of my existence, right? I, that's who I am. This was the loudest the sadness had been in a decade. And so it felt to me that there was nothing else for it except for to, to audit that sadness. It meant finding out and understanding what it was that I was afraid of, right? Putting a name to it, putting a face to it. Hold on tight, Wyatt. Okay. Don't want you falling your brother, and then it'd be on video when the Child Protective <laughs> Services comes. So the record started with uh, a bout of, of um, postpartum depression for me. It's hard to, to say that because I know that he'll see this someday. The depression comes from a place of being afraid of failing you, not in any absence of joy at your existence, but the the paralyzing fear of failing them in some way, in a personal sense or in a global sense, in a one-to-one -one sense or as a society, a culture, a planet, was really very difficult. Because it is scary to be a parent, I think particularly right now, because the world appears to be actively ending. To have children, in the midst of a global pandemic, in an ever worsening climate crisis, in a time where there were four mass shootings in the news this weekend is scary. And so it meant going back and thinking about all of that. And then it meant auditing my life, finding the moments where I felt the safest, the most protected, and finding the moments where I felt the most afraid and most alone and the most helpless and then finding a way to give my children so much more of the former and so much less of the latter. Okay, bud, so let's just play. Every night before we go to bed, he's got a record player in his room and he's got a copy of Suburbia that, um, that Hopeless sent him for his birthday, which was very sweet of the record label. And uh, he drops the needle on it and he has a mic and a stand and he goes, me daddy. And then he points to me and goes, you Josh, and I'm, I'm Josh. And he just runs around the room jumping and, and jumping off stuff. And he pulls out like a little stool and goes, this is my stage. He came to our show at the Fillmore and it was like fantasy camp for him. Cause like one, he knows everyone in the band and he like is obsessed with them. And so to, to be in real life with his buddies was like really cool. He came to the Fillmore show and sound checked with us. Like he had his guitar and he came on stage and like rocked out with us during sound check. During the set, our guitar tech gave him the ukulele to switch out with me, so he got to come out on stage. And then he went and got his guitar and tried to come back out, and my wife was trying to stop him. He doesn't care. Yeah, there's 2,600 people here, and they're here to see me. I'm gonna rock. So even with the concept for the record, I still oh. felt pretty unsure about my ability to, to write a Wonder Years song. I felt like I could still write a song, but could I write a, a great Wonder Years song? Because that is so based in feedback. 
like normally I'm getting feedback from the band or we're getting feedback from the crowd, but in the isolation of the pandemic, that wasn't there. It's just me alone in a basement going, is any of this shit any good? All my damaged ghosts. No, that's not the right word. Dan called me. It was not only during the pandemic, but I was also in chemotherapy at the time. Uh, he called and he said, I'm having a really hard time cracking the code on this one song. I was sitting right here and he played me the song and uh, it was Wyatt's song and it was beautiful. It was, a, it was an amazing song that he had written uh, about the first time that he saw uh, his child's heartbeat on the ultrasound monitor and it was a great song and I'm like, okay, what's, what's the issue? It's an awesome song. And it was something in the chorus and it was a rhyme scheme. It was like, he was trying to go A, B, A, B. And after talking to him for five minutes, I'm like, why do you have, why do you have it stuck in your head that you need to go A, B, A, B? Why don't you just go A, A, B, B? And he's like, oh my God, that's it. That's it, you cracked the code. And I'm like, I didn't do anything. I think Mark just kind of being like, this is great. Like, why don't you do this one little thing right here? Um, and I think hearing that from, you know, somebody who everybody in the band, not only Dan, but everybody looks up to and admires their work and, you know, is a fan of, really, I think, gave him a bit of a, a confidence boost. My take on it is that Dan sounded like he was in a place where he was unsure about some songs. Uh, it sounded like he was second guessing a lot of what he'd written and he played me that one and I was like, that's a beautiful song, man, that's awesome. And then. He's like, oh, here's another song. And he played me a second song. And even just, I mean, here I am right now, just thinking about the second song, it gave me goosebumps. Dan's a phenomenal songwriter. He didn't need any help, but I think what he needed in that moment was somebody to say, dude, these songs are dope. Stop overthinking things and just do what you do, which is go and write great songs. There's always the, the existential threat of what is life? You know, uh, where are we going next, regardless of the pandemic, but those circumstances made things so much more apparent. Because at the end of the day, if you can't be in a room of people, how do you do what we do? Originally, we were supposed to have this record done by the end of 2020. Logistically, it was a hurdle. This record was the hardest one that the Wonders have ever had to make. Um, on every level. Uh, first off, you're a group of six people. Like you've got just so many people in this band and to be able to write in a safe manner when you're in the middle of the beginning of a pandemic and everything is telling you to, you know, stay away from people, stay inside, don't do this or that. And here's a guy with a newborn, basically a super young kid. What was going on in the world? It was, it was rough. You just look anything on social media. It was you know, something that would give you a ton of anxiety and, and make you kind of rethink what you're doing. Can we do this? How do I support my family, my friends, my life? Should I be looking at other options? I get how that was happening for a lot of creative people. I think that people, uh, and especially Wonder Years, and, and maybe most of the artists that I work with were sort of forced into a position to create. When we started writing it, we and everyone else didn't know anything um, about the virus that has like, pretty much ruled everyone's lives for the last several years. So we, everything was in this room, which like might look small to you. It is. <laughs> do we still have it? Please let it just be oh, yeah. in here. It's not set up. But... We don't really know what to do. There was no testing available yet. I would sing inside of this. Are you kidding me? No fucking. <laughs> Like maybe it was too much. Like we had a door we could shut. Like, I don't know. We just like, didn't know. You just well, didn't know that. No, no one knew what yeah. the rules were. You know, it was a little nerve wracking to be popping in and out of band practice at Nick's house. And you would go in. I would go in here and I had a little stool and a little table. <laughs> no way. And I would sing from here. I can't, I can't believe. It made it really hard. And so we gave up on that pretty quickly. We rented an Airbnb. Everyone had to quarantine for several weeks first. After your quarantine, you tested, and then everyone entered the bubble. I want to more members over the uh, Please no. Do you want to show? Let's show Brad our our test real quick. Oh, you got that? That's true. negative. That's yeah. after a, a twelve-day quarantine oh, yeah. and then a test. Up until that time, we said, "Go write at home. Just 
build a cache of songs, of ideas, of riffs, of lyrics, of whatever you want, even of inspiration. Like if you just love a song, just write it down, show it to us there. We all went into this farmhouse and we immediately went downstairs and cleared out the basement, set up all the gear, set up the, wired it all up to record, to demo, set up the computer, had dinner, and then came downstairs and like pitched. Um, you know what? I want to show you guys again. You've already heard it. We had a demo of it, but I just want to reintroduce it is Doors. And I think I've said for a long time, I really think that there is a way, not definitive, we can change it, we can do whatever we want. I really think there's a way that Doors is a really great track one that starts with one guitar and builds. And so I'm just gonna reintroduce the song by playing it again so that it gets added to our list and then we'll move on from sure. it. I don't wanna die. At least not without you. We kind of went into it not 100% knowing exactly what we wanted to do. So there's definitely like a bit of figuring out what it meant to make this new record, you know, like what we really wanted to accomplish with it. The early Ur records were written exclusively all of us in a room 100% of the time. When we first went like serious and we're on the road all the time, like, writing like Suburbia, Greatest Gender Closer to Heaven, those were a lot of time together, like really in it. This record we wrote much more in chunks. We had a lot of time off. This is a long process. The ability to get together and like really hash it out was incredibly important and it was just, you know, it wouldn't, it, we, we could have never made the record that we did, any, any record, without that period of time to like dig in and really like get shit done. Still not necessarily the finished lyrics. I think that those four bars mm. are gonna be really key to like the message of the song. And so I don't feel like I've gotten them right yet. Sure. But I do think that opening the record on the line, I don't wanna die is like crazy powerful. When we were writing the songs, it just felt really, really exciting to me. I think part of it was the joy of being back together. Or I think it's a matter of song? figuring out what the groove is that makes the bridge kind of pop in a cool way. I think maybe uh, I snow. Maybe I need to go back to like like during the bridge part and then when it goes loud it's back to the beat or something. I'm not I'm not totally sure yet. What was kinda cool about it is we're like, well we know no one here actively has COVID, which again to this point there is no vaccine for and no treatment for. And so we could just be free to be in that space and just like kind of concentrate on the work without that hanging over us. I'm hearing um out of that like some kind of it can go to the verse uh, progression but like some kind of like ripping like not guitar solo but like a lead to carry it out to reset and then it'll like you know like what I mean thing, a little thing <laughs> yeah like a little like guitar like riffy t like a yeah. the intro might just be a so the verse it changes it rotates back and forth so to basically go is it every other time or how frequently is it the first and third or the second and fourth time is mostly first and third know. first and third. third and then it hangs on the second the G, oh, yeah. shaped G no, on uh, the, the second, second yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so it did feel really joyful to just kind of like, to be creative again. Okay, so. The last one. So, da -da 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 -da. so uh, the, the turnaround is still just. I was 17. Oh. I was 17. No, it's, what the I fuck is it? Yes. Okay. That's where it comes uh, out. So it's another one that like, you are it's major. definitely like up-tempo, it's major -y, It's a, it's a really strong hook. Didn't I drove you all listening to God only knows when all that I know is you
Yeah, fucking bangs, dude. Uh, yo, my ears went out halfway through, so the click was just swishing. Woo! Monster energy! When we finished at the farmhouse, we had the foundation for what the record would be. I think when we went in there, we really didn't have a clear idea of what this thing would be, but after we left, we knew what we were headed into, knew what we were gonna make. We felt that it had been so long between records that we were like, well, maybe we should get something out. We made Summer Clothes, The Paris of Nowhere, and Lost in the Lights with Will Yip in Philadelphia. We've done little things with Will, and He's just the man, and <laughs> like, we love hanging out with him, and it was local and possible, and he wanted to do it, and the time was there in his schedule, and so we went and made them, and the plan was we're gonna make this EP with Will, and then we're gonna make a full length with Steve. All right, I'm warm. Okay. What if, what if, what if? This song is very expansive. A lot of stuff. Dan, what's the vibe on the pre-courses right now? On, on your end, on the vocal side? I haven't thought about putting some in there. Okay. Because okay, that, th those must feel, it feels crazy. Not, that doesn't feel crazy man. there's no vocals there. It feels crazy to me where it goes without having vocals sure. there. You know yeah, what I mean? I just haven't written any. Yeah. Uh, it's not that I'm opposed to it, it's just like, it doesn't mirror the second one at all, so I wasn't sure exactly. where to sing. I do think musically, it feels empty too. Rather, it's fucking just adding another nice fucking, like, chord under it on the ones. And yeah, ones. I mean, it, it, oh, I, I could take the lyrics play. that I'm fucking with in the first, or in the second verse, like, it's like, da -da 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 -da. Yeah, that's and it. I lost it in the light. That feels very soulful to me too. You know, even that, that shape. Especially you know, where the chords are going, it feels like beautiful. How you wrote, you know what I mean? But I don't know where. Do I do it again after the first loud part, and then what happens in the second pre-chorus? This is kind of what I want to get my head around. That's gonna be. I think that could be cool, man. I think that'd be cool. So then the other question I have for you is, do you want me to sing in the bridge? You weren't planning on singing the bridge. I don't have an, I, I, I feel like I could sing in <laughs> you know, one or the other. I back, I, I back that. Wait, also, I'll sing anywhere you want. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, working with Will is, I mean, he's just really, he's like everyone's cheerleader. He's always so incredibly positive, always just has endless ideas, just like, Oh, let's try this and just like, yeah, hitch record and you're going. You're doing something new and trying something fun. My favorite part of the bridge is, even though it's a little sloppy that we've been doing, is the very end of it before the drop, the da 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 ba 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 I feel like that you can also kind of break up your drum beat, kind of. Because right now it's like a hit section and then kind of like a, a drum solo, and maybe I can combine them. Yeah. It's also, the hits are cool right now, but I think with what you're doing with the drum fills, it takes some of that impact out. Which is yeah. The first hits are yeah, good, right. but then you're in eighth notes and yeah. it's gone. Yeah. The rhythm, yeah. it's, you know what I mean? Let's, just, let's go in there and try to fuck with that real quick. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm just gonna go in. We'll talk. You know, one of my best friends, Vince Ratty, who, you know, produced the Upsides. That was the first piece of music I heard when Vince uh, sent it to me. And I was blown away. I, even at that point, I knew they were on another level compared to other things that were kind of happening around it, you know? They have just grown into a, ba a band that I, am, I admire, a rock band that I admire, I think, you know, was started in like this pop punk kind of world, you know what I mean? Has, has become, straight up a such a reputable and palatable but yet very expansive 
rock band, you know, that I think anybody can enjoy that likes rock music. Let's do a few takes, I'll get the magic. Oh yeah. One. Yeah, that sounds great, man. Awesome. That's Pleb there, you're playing really well. Like, that was a also, the ending, do you want me to kind of like fade it out? I've been trying to do it, or do you want to do that? No, like, I'll just do it. Yeah, I'll just okay. do it. Yeah. Just do you, bro. <laughs> Chemistry with Jeremy is fucking sounds crazy, dude. Choking you up, dude. Choking You're me a little bit flat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Getting so emotional. At heart, what makes the one year great? Their energy, the storytelling, the lyrics, their sense of melody, the rawness in the music. That's that's always been there. How it's been packaged as more of a pop punk thing to more of an alternative rock thing to straight up just a fucking great rock and roll band. That evolution has been such an important important thing for them, but at the end of the day, those core things, you know, that's what makes the Wonder Years the Wonder Years. That sounds great. Yeah, I think that'll be nice. Oh, perfect time, dude. Balls, bro. Dude, the, I think this is the, the longest, most pronounced falsetto part in any Wonder Years song. Dude, it sounds so, in the pre it sounds so good. There's only ever been one other, or two other falsetto parts ever. Yeah, that's We were in a position where we were hearing the songs that we were making with Will, and just like, Man, we love them so much, and we don't want to underserve them. And just putting them out on an EP feels like it could be seen and perceived as like, oh, this is just like a throwaway thing, or like they put it on the EP because they don't feel like it's worthy of being on the record, which was like obviously very untrue. And so we called the label and said, like, hey, listen, I know that you wanted it to be on these separate releases, but we just think that the songs are too strong and it would be a waste of them. And like, we want them on the record. We've never split production on a record like this. It's always just one guy, usually Steve Evans. This, the relationship with Steve is very notable to me personally and also I think to the whole uh, Wonder Years Corporation. I want to be able to figure out how to do harmonics. Oh, you're talking about the R and the B. Yeah, yeah. I just love, I love the guys all dearly, you know, like family. And we have a really great creative synergy together. I, Honestly, it needs to be ugly. Is that the yeah. second verse? Yeah. So I think, I think, I think it needs I'm to catatonic be. catatonic wandering on. You know, we all kind of like know each other so well that and not in a comfortable way where it's like it's we're gonna repeat the same things. We're always still challenging ourselves and always still pushing ourselves. Working with Steve brings a familiarity and an extended you know path of trust that that we've built uh, across a number of records. This record now, after all these years, we're friends. You know, it's not like a coach working on a player or whatever. I mean, I've had, you know, close to a 30-year career at this point, and there's a handful of artists that I could say that I have that kind of creative synergy with. And they're definitely one of the bands, and, and you know, I, I'll, I'll do it till, till the end of time if I can, you know, because it's just, it's wonderful. That's really at the core of going into the studio and making a record is you have to, you're letting someone else into that circle, and you have to wholeheartedly believe that they not only have the best interest of the record at hand, but also understand the vision uh, that we're trying to, to put forward, you know? I mean, work with Steve, I mean, it's just, it's work with Steve. I mean, I love Steve, you know, we've done so much with him. It's just, literally you show up and it's like, yeah, we're working with Steve, let's go. I missed that double, Steve. Other than that, pretty good. So tomorrow we're just gonna run it. We're just gonna run the whole record a bunch of times, make sure that we're in playing shape, and then we get a day off, and then it's up to 6.06. Uh, 
Well, we're a band, and we're a business, uh, and we are also a family. I mean, this is the original members since I was 17, so I think it's natural for our lives to uh, interact and affect each other and then be reflected in the art we create. Oh, I just want to do a crash with your change, dude. Kadadu, kadadu. Uh, we could, you know, move those. Yeah, those. sure. I think that'll. I think that's yeah. better. I think I'd be lying, and anybody would be lying if they said that being in such close quarters and in any sort of relationship for that long, it comes with the ups and downs. But it always comes back home to knowing those are the the people that you can trust. I'm, I'm oh, FaceTiming yeah. Joe Mario. You want to say hi? I, uh, yeah, the yeah, line between cool. bandmates and friends yeah. is incredibly complicated. There's growing pains, but you have the history to kind of reconcile and give one another space. It's nice to know everybody's kind of ticks and their habits and they're like, oh, I can see he's gonna start to bubble over or you know yourself that like, I'm gonna start to bubble over and being more mature now that like, you can be like, I, we need a tenor. It's one of these times where I took- <laughs> I'm gonna fucking Put the Rocky steps on it! Can you turn the camera up for one second? <laughs> and like, everybody can cool off and be like, deep breath and being older now and more mature and going through some of these things helps smooth the transition that is being bandmates and also a, a way that we're fortunate enough to get to make a living. You ready, Brad? You're being the cameraman right now. We're, we can't interact. <laughs> we had a good amount of pre production, which was great. We never had that much before. We had like three or four days usually each time. This time we had like I think it was like nine days. And then uh, after that, we order up to 606, um, which is the Foo Fighter studio. It was a bit overwhelming. On the console there, which is the infamous Sound City console, there's a picture of Dave Roll's kit while recording Nevermind. I feel like that alone kind of sums up a lot of how almost surreal it is to be in a studio like that. I mean, it's just walls of gear, you know, all of Foo Fighters touring gear over the years, just a ludicrous amount of stuff. Steve, what's up, bro? Oh. I didn't know what you wanted to do there. <laughs> I'm coming underneath. We are at hey, Studio 606, where we're here. gonna do oh, yeah, drums, yeah. and I think maybe bass and, uh, See, he's working on the board here, the big board to fill it all in. But uh, this is the place, I guess. I don't know. It's Everyone's pretty awestruck. I demo on my iPhone voice notes, which I think is probably just as good, so I don't really get it. I had gotten fortunate, because it's uh, it's not generally like open to booking to, for the public. You have to know, have to have it in there. And I got in through, through um, through a management company that uh, I know, and it's just a great, great room, and that Neve console is legendary. If you ever saw the Sound City documentary um, that Dave Grohl made, uh, he bought the the board from Sound City where they recorded Nevermind, and you know, so many legendary records were made on that console. Day one, setting up, getting ready to thump out some tunes for you. When we were kids, when I was 22, was scary as shit. In this uh, first day, kind of, uh, how much of it's waiting around it made me very anxious when I was young. Because, you know, you record these songs and stuff, and it's time to lay them on down, slippity slap. <laughs> but it's like, no, it isn't actually. It's time to sit on your ass for nine hours while these guys get everything ready. Then you, you better be ready then, because if you're not, shame. And the shame hurts. Aggressive, dude. I want to hear more of that ride. Yeah, I hear that.
Yeah, I stopped buying clothes in my mid twenties. The only shoes I have with me here, I have I have Tevas and running shoes. Period. That's it, dude. And the dog, bro. Michael, I'm gonna break this fucking what? camera, Brad. <laughs> <laughs>
center line doesn't have enough syllables to say what I want to say, so I have to move it to the third line, which is like the longer one. But then if I move it to the third line, I have to adjust the entire rhyme scheme. So that's what I'm working on now. Obviously the lyrics are sometimes devastating, but always heartfelt and honest and, you know, very poetic at times. The amount of work will do to have the song's details that he's, that he's singing or writing about be as true or accurate as they could be is like pretty amazing. He knows how to really sell you the imagery with his lyrics, and that's very few, very few artists have that have that capability. And that's why he's been such an important lyricist and a songwriter for so long, and that's why he's gonna be a songwriter for the rest of his life. Oh, you know what we should change it to? It should be Ask. Cause she'll like check with my mom to see if I'm okay. Cause I know how you ask around and worry when you hear the mm. songs. Yeah. So I just call to let you know that I'm I mean, that right almost no makes more what. sense. It makes more sense. There you go, solve the puzzle. It's really been really fun to watch their evolution. Cause they, they had a, a sophistication in what they were doing even on the earlier stuff. When we did Suburbia, they were still trying to figure it out. Greatest Generation, they were getting figuring it out more. No Closer to Heaven was really where I feel like it was the first time they, they really kind of like, here's our three guitar parts, and like, this is how they all work together, and it makes this whole, it makes this really great, you know, joyous noise. And then they, they really evolved into like the soundscapey kind of stuff on, on, on uh, Sister Cities, and then we brought some of that element into what we did on, on The Hum. I think we've always stayed true to ourselves, and whether that means, you know, making a record that is maybe trying something a little bit different. I mean, we always try to sound like the Wanderers. I always think we will being the six people in the band. I always want to one-up whatever it is that I want to accomplish or figure out how to do, you know, whatever I want to do in that moment in time. And it's, it's ever-changing. Well, let's try, see what You know, one day it'll just be like, I want to do this certain thing or use this one weird guitar tone and actually make it stick. You have a dry off and it's like the onset is immediate, so it's like... <laughs> and I can just be playing the knobs too. It's just always constantly figuring out how to make whatever weird shaped puzzle piece I have fit into the puzzle. I didn't want to do a stereo thing. I want to come, I want to keep this more intimate. Yeah. Creatively speaking, as a guitar player, I would not be making 100% of the same choices that I made on those older records. And I think that's okay. I think I had to make those choices to get to the space where I'm making the choices that I'm making now. And I think that reflection is a really healthy part of that creative journey. I might catch, catch a slightly different part um, because the other one is meant to go like with Nick, but if it's just gonna be like solo in that first it's verse, pretty, it's pretty fucking epic like this. It's always a work in progress. The band's always a work in progress, and I, I think I, I lean into that that sentiment pretty heavily these days. I said this a couple times, and I know that every time I say it, the record label hates that I say it. I'm going to say it anyway. I do not care if we gain one single fan for making this record. I don't give a fuck if a single new person listens to the Wonder Years. I wanted to make a record for Wonder Years fans. We're active participants in what's happening here and trying to make something we know that people have an emotional connection to and that's amazing. And so getting to continue that relationship is like really intense and powerful. When we finished with Steve, uh, I mean, my brain was just shattered. It didn't feel like we were finished. I just felt like my whole reality was the home goes on forever. It only, you know, it took a little bit of time to decompress and to get the mixes and to actually hear the concrete results of what we did, to hear the songs and not just the individual hyper-focused on moments that I not just felt like relief, but joy. I was like, holy cow, we made something incredible uh, despite 
the challenges in their room. When we canceled the rest of our tour dates that, of the tour that we were on, um, when cities started shutting down in, in March of 2020, we're like, yeah, we'll be back in eight weeks. Like we literally rebooked those tour dates for May of 2020. And then those got canceled and we thought, okay, but our tour in the fall is still run, right? And when that got canceled, at least in my own head had decided, that's the end of live music. It'll never come back or at least we won't come back. Part of me was excited about the songs and then the other part of me said, why are we even fucking making this? We're never gonna play it. And that's like the most important thing about the Wonder Years is the live show, right? That is like, that's where the band lives. We have always centered everything on that live show, on that moment of community, on that connection with the fans, on that exchange of energy. You can't do that. I don't wanna do any of it. We're in the studio on the last day, about to wrap. And we got a call that said like, hey, um, this other band has COVID and we need you to come play direct support on this festival. Will you do it? Everybody involved is like still has that DIY, like super scrappy basement band, VFW band mentality. Comfort aside, logistics aside, if it's possible, we'll, we're gonna make it work. Yes, fuck it. Let's go. There was no rehearsal. There was pieced together gear. Everyone agreed to do it with less than 24 hours notice. The whole crew assembled at the Man Center and it was truly like, let's see how this goes. Soupy's on stage and he's you know, visibly crying. And he said something to the extent of like, since we've been on a stage together. 680 days, 680 days since we've been on a stage in the greatest city in the fucking world. Getting to interact with audiences with this music will be the kind of real test and the real measure of what's about to happen next. My biggest hope is people are going to love it and give it the same respect that we put into writing the songs and crafting the songs. I hope people find whatever it is they need to find from it. The record covers a lot of different elements that I think people will find ways to relate to. indescribable. To be back on a stage, and not just any stage, but a stage in Philadelphia. 680 days, and I hated every goddamn one of them. You think you missed us? <laughs> no. No, we miss you. To be back in front of and with our people, to have our crew there, indescribable. When we jump, you jump. Jump! Just call 
I'm